Oh, Cisco. I saw a documentary, Dawn Song, right? Yeah. You know, Dawn Like a Truck. What, what? That was like, what? Uh, all night long. All right. Let me see that thong. But at one point, what they say? Living, it was living a vida loca. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Right? Yeah. So Cisco knew the guy who wrote that song. It wasn't, was it Ricky Martin? Ricky Martin. It wasn't Ricky Martin. He was just a performer of it, but he knew the guy who wrote it. So he thought he was going to go ahead and get a clearance, but for whatever reason, he forgot to do it before the song actually came out. When the song came out, right? Oh, and it started performing like it was performing. Man. Of course they hit him up. Of but that that line that got repeated three times throughout the entire song, Living a V La Loca, bruh. They they said that that songwriter owned and made more money from the song than everybody else combined. That's crazy. Like the Cisco, the producers, all that. So that has to be from impact. Yeah. That's my only argument. Like, yeah. like, how can you justify such a something that's literally, when you look at it objectively, a small part of the song? How yeah. do you quantify that? It must be, oh, the impact. And if you gauge it, I don't know what time. Let me look at when um, uh, Living a Vida Loca came out. Because it also might have been a hot song at the time. You know what I mean? It had a certain. All right. So that was 1999. And then Thong Song came out. Wait a minute. Oh, ho, ho, ho. it came out in 1999. Oh, shit. Dang. So, yeah, that thing was fresh. <laughs> but he tried, man, bro. He really risked it. Yeah, he risked it. He should have got it before, uh, clear beforehand. Man. Yeah. So, that's that right there, uh, again, goes to Impact. Yeah, because Impact in, included, I could understand what the ones that are saying no. I could, I could get that because I... I will feel that way if if I my part of the song was the most memorable part of the song and like you just wrote like a cool bridge and it's mm-hmm. like nah bro everybody in the club singing my shit like right. the, the viral part on TikTok is my part I could I could understand it then but I right. do think the overall notion of equality across the room right. does probably make the room work harder right and look to be fair I think that objectively speaking and looking at how things played out that song could have did damn well probably the same without that line. However, in that time, it was highly arguable, yeah. right, to say that this has that level of impact. Yeah. So I yeah. get it. It's arguable. Would you have been saying that shit in the first place if I didn't write that song? There's no way he would have said that if that song didn't come out. Yeah, that's a good point, like, A bro. black guy would never been say, you know what <laughs> yeah. I mean? He'd like never been saying that song. So yeah, I, so impact has to have some I'm assuming impact, um, I mean, outcome on how they judge it in court and things like that when, when it goes that far. But, but man, I mean, I think this is just a person by person basis or how people are willing to, to go about it. It seems like I know quite a few producers who have a similar relationship mm-hmm. to this because they work together so much. You're like, hey, one of these things is going to hit at some point. You know what I mean? And yeah. we don't know which one's going to hit. We don't know which one's going to get recorded to, da, da, da. But we just keep working. And if you on it, we get, they bust down their percentages somewhat similar. Producers, if y'all are in any of those circles that are pretty free and you can kind of trust and move like that, let us know. But but we do know if you have a circle like that, that can move like that, that you trust, man, it makes creativity flow so much easier. Yeah. All right. Not having to deal with the business in that way. Now you might, knock somebody outside of your circle over the head. I think that's the more realistic way to have it. I got my circle. We bust it down even. Outside that circle, it is what it is. Just like the Mikos, right? Three ways. It don't matter if Buddy got left off of Bad and Bougie. You know what I mean? It's like we bust it down equal. We take care of the fam and it is what it is. Yeah. So I get both sides. But yeah, again, my solution is probably your specific circle that you can trust and move with like that. Y'all eat. If you have that type of circle. And you don't have to do that way either. But 100% 100% outside of that circle, it probably only makes sense to get what you can out of the situation. You don't even know the people, and it is all this. Now, check this out from none other than Ray Daniels. He makes it. She has everything to do with publishing. How I do it on the urban side was, was that the beat was 50%, the hook was 20, each verse was 10, and the bridge was 10. 
a verse and a hook, I'm taking 30%. But when I got to the pop side, it was it was way different. They just split everything even. It's like, yo, it's eight writers, break it down. The reason why I like their way better is because now we're not worried about who contributed and did what. Like now, if CJ's in the room, I'm not worried about did CJ program the gr drums properly because he's in the room. We're going to split this evenly. So this is his baby as much as it's my baby. Rather than the way Urban side is, we're going to write the hook. I wrote the hook. Man, I, I gave him the first four words on the intro. It's like, come on, bro. If we all know it's our song equally, we care more. So if I wrote the hook and Tamira has a better line for it, I'm not thinking, oh, man, she just cut into my 20%. I'm mm -hmm. like, hey, this is our shit. Help yeah. me out. Give me something. It's more collaborative rather than who did what and claiming and fighting over pennies. I just don't believe in that. All right. Now, I know some of y'all might have y'all thoughts on this, but I do think he made some valid points. So we're going to discuss yeah. all sides because there were a couple notable names who had their own thoughts on this as well. Corey, what do you think, though? Yeah, I, I do think it's interesting, man. I, I do think there are cultural differences between, let's just say, rap and pop when it comes to collaboration. Because pop in itself is a naturally collaborative um, genre because, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I hate to be that guy, but, you know, most pop artists kind of get brought into situations where there's a <laughs> there's a team of people helping them. They're bred yeah. from day one to be collaborative yeah. versus rap tends to be this like hey I, like i got it out of the mud you know what i'm saying type of genre like look at what i can do and what i can kind of handle so yeah. i do think that there's a, a natural affinity for pop artists to kind of want to collaborate and i could see how this process would be beneficial because like you said it's like everybody's making the same amount there's an there's equal drive for us to make sure that this thing does well versus you know if i know i'm only getting paid to 10 percent for the hook I might have a great idea for the verse, but I might hold it back because it's like, I ain't gonna pay for that. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm gonna let the guy get paid for the verses. You know what I'm saying? Show approve what, what he can do. So that's the one thing that I love about his suggestion and the equal splits. Now you have truly everybody there mm -hmm. trying to create the best song possible. Yep. Because now we're getting an equal percentage, but we only can increase our percentage by making the song do as good as possible. Yeah. All right? And it has to be a better song theoretically right to perform better yeah otherwise my other my competition is not only the marketplace but the other person creating this song with me so i like that aspect of it every artist i've ever talked to says the most awkward part of a studio session is when everybody has to sit down and talk about the splits <laughs> <laughs> like almost every artist i talk to is like that's when it gets uncomfortable because like i guess reality sets in that this is business you know what i'm saying like you just yeah. have fun making music you know what I'm saying? Then it's like, all right, before you leave this room, let's get this legal shit in order. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Nobody leave this room before we get this down on paper. So I, I would assume that if I walked in a room where I know like, okay, all of us in here are getting the same percentage of this. Yeah, that takes some weight off my shoulder. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and, and yeah. like you said, it makes me a little bit more artistically free or a little bit more creatively free. So that that's why I, like, I could, I, I get that. Like, I, I agree with that. Like, I on paper, at least to a non songwriter, you know, I'm gonna throw it out there, guys. Um, you know what I'm saying? It makes a lot of sense to me, bro. Like, bust it down evenly, bro, and let the let the audience decide who should, I guess, quote unquote, be paid more off of it. Right, right. <laughs> let me take a quick second to say if you're an artist trying to blow your music up, or if you're a manager, a music professional in general trying to help an artist blow their music up, I have something that's a game changer for you, and it's completely free. As you may know, we've helped multiple artists go from zero to hundreds of thousands of streams. We've helped multiple artists go from hundreds of thousands to millions of streams, chart on Billboard, go viral, all of that stuff. And we've now made the way we've branded multiple artists and helped them go viral completely free, step by step in Brandman Network. All you have to do is check out brandmannetwork.com. You apply. It's completely free. But the thing is, we're not going to let everybody in forever. So the faster you apply, the better your chance of getting accepted. Brandmannetwork.com. Check it out. Back to the video. Now, I know a lot of people handle that awkward conversation by just letting the managers yeah, get to it, right? Yeah. That's a great buffer. So that's always nice. So you and the artist can maintain your relationship, let managers do whatever they got to do. Oh, man, he be tripping. Bro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know how I go, man. <laughs> got to posture and say what you got to say to get through it. So, but yeah, that that's definitely going to be an ongoing conversation. I'm sure there's not going to be one answer um, for the whole thing. But since I did mention Cisco as a part of this, if y'all have not seen, it's either a voice or a no noisy documentary on Cisco Thong Song. It's a brilliant documentary. And the amount of creativity that he put towards that process is really dope. 
Like it was dope because they had they, the producers made this beat. They did it for Michael Jackson. They even went Cisco. Like they played it for him by mistake, and they were like, "Oh, dope. I can't even imagine Michael Jackson on that." Beat. <laughs> <laughs> what? But it wasn't. They didn't. You know, the Dome song part didn't exist. Yeah, right? okay, you know yeah, what I mean? okay. That yeah. part didn't exist. <laughs> That would be wild, right? But so he ends up like writing this song, the story of how he even comes up with Thong's song. He like went on a date and he saw a thong for the first time. Like this hmm. is when it was in time. The nineties was wild, bro. bro. That's crazy. It was, it's wild because the funny part is, and he told his friends about it, and they were like, "Wait, what?" And then they start like some niggas going out into the city trying to find girls and get you know. Smash and then hopefully see a thong come across this yeah. myth- <laughs> this mythical thong he sp- spoke of, and then the friend came back. And one of them was like, "Yo, bro, guess what? What I found?" found. And he was like, "What? That thong, the thong, thong, thong." And that's where that part came from. <laughs> like, like they, and they threw it in for a joke and whatever, but he didn't think it was gonna stay. So it was like the way it came about. And then you see Cisco creatively say, hey, this isn't enough. He went and found a violinist. And you listen back to that song, like that's a huge part of the song. Yeah. Like he went and found that. It was and, and the dude who played the violin, like he was so far from that type of music. Like a classical music. Yeah, dude, like yeah. A, a, a legit older white man well my, I don't know, he might have been younger then but nah our age he was still older than me right yeah he um and knew nothing really of those that genre and cisco kind of like had him play it and it was like yeah that's exactly how i want it and when it came out and it was a hit he was so detached and he when his friends and people was like start talking about it, he was like i wonder if that's that song i played that riff for <laughs> like, <laughs> like that's how detached he was but cisco was like just grabbing people and like, even against the producers um, you know, Will and ironically, Michael Jackson loved the thong song so much he dubbed the producers and I'm like, yo, well, let's get into the yeah, studio. I heard that story before, yeah. bro. Yeah, I, yeah. I remember hearing that. I was like, man, who like who would have thought, bro, thong song be what hey, tickle Michael Jackson's bro. fancy. Hey, bro, Michael. <laughs> no, man. I mean, I'm not gonna get the tickles, but Michael <laughs> look, my, my Michael was definitely an interesting dude the more and more I've heard about him.